Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for all your blessings. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you love each one of us so dearly and that your longing is to have us with you for eternity. Lord, thank you that we can see that the signs are here, that your coming is at the door. And I pray, Lord, as we study your word tonight, that you will give us clear minds and understanding and that we will prepare to meet you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight's topic is Revelation's final events. I think humanity has always been intrigued with space travel. And a few years ago, they relaunched the Columbia shuttle. It all went very well, and the seven astronauts went up, and it was taken for granted that everything would go well on the way down as well. But sadly, it didn't end well, and on, at the beginning of February 2003, the Columbia went to smithereens. Seven of the best and brightest lost their lives. The families were devastated. The world was in shock. But tonight we want to talk about a journey that will not only begin well, but will also end well. You see, our commander is going to get us home. Friends, that journey will take us past the moon. It will take us past the planets, past the sun, past the nebulae, through the gap in Orion. It's going to be the greatest space trip in history. And what's so amazing about this journey is going to start with something that goes beyond the minds of scientists. Death will be overcome. Man's greatest enemy will be defeated. God's end time plan is revealed in His Word. If you would like to know what this is going to be like, we need to study the Word of God. And friends, it doesn't help to just have it next to your bedside or have it on the coffee table. You need to read it. You need to study it. The central theme of Revelation is Jesus. It's not the seven-headed beast. It's not the dragon. It's not the seven last plagues. The central theme of the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ. Revelation 14 verse 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the son of man. Having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Friends, when he came the first time, he came as a baby. He came unnoticed, but not so when he comes the second time. He's going to come in glory and there's a crown on his head. King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming with a sickle in his hand to reap the harvest of the earth. Revelation 19 verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. A white horse is a symbol of purity, victory, and triumph. Christ comes to vanquish the enemy. He comes as King of kings and Lord of lords. Friends, Jesus is coming in power and might. He is not coming secretly. There's nothing secret about His second coming. 
Revelation 11 verse 15. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Just think of it. If the president of South Africa should come and visit Bessonia, it won't be secret. They will block off the roads. There will be cars that are, you know, protecting and guiding the presidential vehicle. And think about the king of kings, the king of the universe. When he comes, there will be nothing secret about it. And then the question, friends, how can I be ready? We looked at the signs the other night. Jesus is coming soon. Sooner than any of us can realize here tonight. And you might be wondering, how can I be ready? God is not some mystic guessing about the future. God is not trying to keep any information from us. Jesus does not guess. He knows. Bible prophecy does not guess. It knows. The second coming is not vague. It is specific. Friends, the prophecy with regard to Christ's second coming is repeated 1,518 times in the Word of God. Sometimes we speak to our children and we say something three times and five times and we think we've said it now enough. Jesus' coming is repeated 1,518 times. It's the most repeated prophecy in the Bible. For every prophecy with regard to His first coming, there are eight with regard to His second coming. When you go to the New Testament, every fifth verse, if you work it out, every fifth verse says Jesus is coming again. And that's good news. The second coming is not an, un uh, not an unidentified flying object. It's not a UFO. The coming Messiah will not rise up as an earthly charismatic leader. God's end time plan is revealed in His Word. If you'd like to know how Jesus is going to come, you need to start studying the Word of God. Study it personally. Study it prayerfully. And God will speak to your heart in a very intimate way. Luke 17, 23. Men will tell you, there he is, or here he is. Do not go running off after them. You see, friends, with every truth that God has given us, Satan has also come with deception. He always has a counterfeit. So do you think he'll have a counterfeit coming of Christ? Most definitely. And Jesus warns his disciples, and especially those living in the end of time, do not be deceived. If somebody says, he's in Chicago, or he's in New York, or he's in Orlando, or he's in Las Vegas, or he's in Pretoria. Is there Loftus Fersfeld? Don't go. Don't go. For the Son of Man in His day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. There's nothing secret about lightning. Ask our dog. If they're just a little rumbling, she's begging to come inside. Christ is coming down from above. He won't rise up from below. A few years ago, a young married couple moved to Toronto, moved into a, um, a new little house, and as they were unpacking, they put their barbecue outside on the porch and when they went out the one morning it was gone two days later it was back again 
And here was a note. <clears throat> we just borrowed it. Sorry for the inconvenience. We've given you now two tickets. Enjoy the show. And these two thought, well, this is really, you know, wonderful. You know, these people are so kind in this area. They took the tickets, went out to the show, and when they came back, their house was empty. You see, friends, they didn't really understand what it was all about. And there are millions of people today who don't really understand what Christ's coming is about. God has truth, but there is so much error, and sadly has even been proclaimed in religious circles. Error is running rife. I'm going to go through a few principles here tonight. Christ's coming will be a literal event. It's not something that happens in your mind. It's not something secret. It's not something mystic. It is literal. When Jesus came the first time, did he come literally? Definitely he did. When Jesus ascended to heaven, we read in Acts 1 verse 11, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. A real Christ ascended and a real Christ will descend. The Bible is simple. We must just believe. The same Jesus who made the lame to walk, who made the blind to see, who fed the 5,000, who even raised the dead, that same Jesus is returning to this earth. Christ's coming will be a visible event. If someone says to you, Jesus came, and you didn't see it, then don't believe it. Revelation 1 verse 7, Behold, He is coming with clouds, and every eye will see Him. How many eyes? Every eye will see Him. Christ's coming will be an audible event. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16. For the Lord Himself, it's personal, will descend from heaven with a, not a whisper friends, with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God. These words have been carefully chosen. Not the guitar, not the harp, but the, the loudest instrument that we have, the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Before coming here tonight, I conducted a memorial service for a man, a friend of mine, Weston, who was only 43 years old. His eldest son, And this was so amazing. He stood up. There's Gift and Wendy and Weston Jr. And before I spoke, they all gave a tribute tonight. I've never witnessed that. And Gift is writing a trick shortly. And he said he was hoping that his dad could share the joy of him passing the trick. His daughter got up and sang abide with me and the young one stood up and said if it wasn't for my dad I wouldn't be what I am today you know friends death is certainly our greatest enemy and with the coming of Jesus death is going to be defeated and the dead in Christ will rise first. Maybe someone here has lost a loved one. Maybe you have buried a child. 
Maybe it's a father or a mother or a brother or a sister. I have good news tonight. When Jesus comes, the dead in Christ will rise first. It's something that goes beyond the mind of the greatest scientist. How the dead will be made alive again. Yes, friends, the trumpet will sound. A trumpet of victory. A trumpet of a new start. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I would like you to note we'll be caught up together with them. If I say to you tonight, let's go with me to the hall. How do we go? We go to Together. Nobody's going before anybody else. The Bible is easy enough for a child to understand. I'm going to read again. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. Take note, Jesus' feet will not touch the earth when He comes. We meet Him in the air. If anybody walks around on this earth and claims to be Jesus, don't believe Him. We meet Jesus in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. If you look at the Greek, it says, in this manner. And those two preceding verses, verse 16 and 17, describe how we're going to meet the Lord. In this manner, we shall always be with the Lord. Matthew 24 verse 26. Therefore if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Because friends, our senses will pick up information that's so strong that it might even override our belief. So don't go. Don't even try because you might be misled. Christ's coming will be a glorious event. It is the expectation of the ages when Jesus comes and puts an end to sin. Matthew 24 verse 27 For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Yes, friends, Jesus is coming. He's coming again. This is real. This is true. It's fact. He's coming again. The real Christ is coming in the sky. The real Christ is coming to resurrect the dead. I'm sure all of us have visited a graveyard. It's a quiet, sad place, isn't it? But I want to tell you, when Jesus comes, they're going to be the busiest places on earth. The angels are coming with Jesus. The sky is going to be filled with angels, with trumpet sound. It's going to be so bright. You know, the artists try their best to depict it, but it's, it's much better than that. It's the most glorious event that we'll ever witness. Matthew 24, verse 30. The Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. Here is the other side of the coin. You see, friends, there are two groups when Jesus comes. The one group is expecting Him to come and the other group has rejected Him. It is not only believers who will see him when he comes. When Christ comes the second time, every eye sees him. Not only those of the believers, also of the ungodly. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. You see, friends, Jesus comes literally. He comes visibly. 
He comes audibly and He comes gloriously. Christ's coming will be a climactic event. It's the climax of the ages. You don't get better than this. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 to 53. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. But we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. You see, friends, when Jesus comes, there are righteous that are resting in their graves, and there are righteous that are alive on the earth. When the dead are resurrected, they come forth with a glorified body, with an immortal body. Tonight, Dr. Bruce was talking about, you know, these creams and these things that, you know, you know what, in heaven there will be no more oil of Olay. <laughs> and that's good news. No more wrinkles. No more false teeth. No more glasses. No more erosions. <laughs> Immortal body. But now what about those that are alive? You know, something must happen... To them, because otherwise, if, if we go up like this, there's going to be a marked difference between those that were resurrected and, and those who, who were alive on the earth. So, so something must happen to us as well. And if you just for a moment blink your eye with me. It's quite fast, isn't it? In the twinkling of an eye, like that, we're going to be changed. From mortal to immortal. For the trumpet will sound... The dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with reality. Yes, friends, when Jesus comes, sin is coming to an end. The consequences of sin are coming to an end. And I'm so glad that Dr. Bruce is, is moving away from you know, just treating disease are trying to improve health because doctors are going to be out of work in heaven. No hospitals. No sick beds. No funeral parlors. No cemeteries. That's good news. When Jesus comes, this earth is coming to an end. Life will not continue on this planet after Jesus comes. The Bible teaches that the wicked will be destroyed by the brightness of His coming. Cities will just crumble. Angels are coming. You know, one day I was, I was lying on my bed there in Zerist, and I looked out the window and I thought to myself, you know, these beautiful pictures we have of the second coming, you see an, a few angels. But who can paint 10,000 times 10,000? Thousands of thousands. It's gonna, there's going to be angels everywhere. The whole sky is going to be full of angels. It's going to be so glorious. And, and if you think of one angel, the brightness of one angel, we won't be able to look at it. The sky is going to be full of angels. And those who are waiting for the coming of Jesus are going to say, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for Him. Just imagine the joy, the excitement to see Jesus coming. Revelation 15 verse 3. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. A few years ago, a pastor was on his way to church to preach. And sadly, he was killed in a car accident. And after this event, his wife was talking to, to somebody. And she said, you know, when my husband is resurrected, when Jesus comes, he's probably going to ask me, but wasn't I on my way 
to preach. And she says, yes, you were, but you've just taken a nap. And now we're on our way to heaven. Two and a half years ago, we were in a car accident. We were on our way to Durban for a wedding. My father-in-law was going to conduct the wedding, the wedding of his youngest son. And you know, friends, I thought about this when I read this story. And when he wakes up, he's going to say, but, but weren't we on our way to a wedding? And we'll say, yes, we were, but now we're on our way to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Just imagine the joy of loved ones coming together again. Husbands and wives seeing each other. Friends, this is a glorious event. People are going to glorify God when those broken homes are put together again. When those links in the chain that have been removed are locked in again for eternity. Friends, this is something to live for. We need to plan for it. We plan for our vacations, don't we? This one will never end. No disappointments on this holiday. Isaiah 25 verse 9. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for Him and He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. But friends, sadly, there are two groups when Jesus comes. Those who are ready and those who aren't. The saved and the lost. The just and the unjust. And the reaction is different to the coming of Jesus. When I was a little boy, police vans used to be yellow. Do you remember that time? The yellow police vans. And I'll never forget, you know, we had a lot of freedom those days. You could walk around in the streets and weren't really scared of crime. And sometimes we were a bit naughty. I can remember sometimes picking up some stones and we started throwing them and see how well you can throw. And some of my friends used to aim for those light bulbs, you know, um, in the street, the street lights. And I'm so thankful that I never you know, smashed any of those bulbs. But you can imagine walking along, throwing stones, being naughty, and the next moment here comes one of those yellow police vans. What are you going to do? You're going to throw that stone down and you're going to run for the nearest bush, aren't you? The next day you're walking back from school. And as you're walking along, you know, you've being good at school and looking forward to the nice lunch that mom has prepared. And as you're walking along, you turn back and you see somebody walking behind you. And you become a little suspicious. And then you look back again and, and you see this person seems to be walking a bit faster. And, and you decide, well, I better hurry up. And you start walking faster. And the faster you walk, the faster this person is walking. And, and then you see this person starting to run. And you decide, well, I'm not going to have time to, to get home. I'm going to have to cut the corner here and try and just hide. And as you're running and your heart is beating in your throat, the next moment here comes the yellow police van. The same police van as yesterday, the same policeman as yesterday. What is your response this time? You run to him and you say, Mr., Mr., please help me. And you jump in with him. What is the difference? Yesterday you were outside of the law. You were in the wrong. Today you are in the law. And that's why your response is different. You see, friends, there's a group that's going to say, this is our Lord. This is the one we've been waiting for. And the other group is going to say, let the mountains fall on us. We don't want to see Him. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the command commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the 
of His wrath has come and who is able to stand? Friends, they'll be running in all directions. They'll be fleeing. They'll be screaming. They'll be shouting. They'll be hiding in holes to get away from the one who they rejected. But God's people will run toward Him. We will welcome Him with open arms. We've waited for Him so long. And now it's happened. Now it's come. I don't know if you've ever waited for a visitor to come. Maybe your granny or grandfather. I know my children, today they were also waiting because <clears throat> the grandparents were coming. And you know, they watch the road and they're waiting and although there might be a delay, they eventually come, don't they? And there's that rejoicing, there's that reunion. And the wait was worthwhile. Yes, friends, we have been waiting for Jesus. How long have we waited? A few years? In the light of eternity, it's nothing. Let's keep on watching the road. He's going to come. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today we need to make a decision. Friends, we don't know what is beyond this night. We need to decide on which side are we. The prophet Elijah said, How long will you falter between two opinions? We need to choose. I want to be part of the group that says, this is my God. I've waited for Him. Our eternal destiny is being settled by the choice we make today. If we go through the summary now, we'll see what happens when Jesus comes. There will be great seismic upheavals. Friends, islands are going to disappear. Mountains are going to fall. There's going to be an earthquake like never before. The righteous dead are raised. The righteous living are changed. Immortality is bestowed. You know, if you think you feel good coming out of, you know, a spa, a health spa or a, a nice massage, friends, you haven't experienced anything yet. To receive immortality. That vitality and life pulsing through us is going to be amazing. The wicked living are destroyed. The righteous welcome Christ. The righteous go to heaven. Then the question, but what about the secret rapture? There's more than 70 and it's growing variations on the secret rapture. What does the Bible say about this? Matthew 24 verse 36. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father, my father only. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. We had a, a bad experience on the 17th of October. Our double cab vehicle was stolen. Now, if we had known when they were coming, we would have prepared, wouldn't we? But they always come unexpectedly. This is not talking, this is talking about the time of Jesus coming, not the manner. It's important. The time is unexpected. It's not talking about the manner of His coming. The thief example is not talking about the manner. It's talking about the time of His coming. When Jesus comes as a thief, the world will not expect it either. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, 
the heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. The second coming is a surprise to the unprepared. This is an important point. He comes as a thief to those who are not prepared. But those who are waiting for His coming, it will be a relief to see Him come. What about the expression, one taken and the other left? Luke 17, 36 says, Two men will be in the field, the one will be taken, the other left. What does this mean? You must remember that this whole theory has been built on one verse. Let's look at this verse. Luke 17, 26, it says, As it was in the days of Noah. This is important. We need to go and study what happened in the time of Noah. As it was in the time of Noah, there were two groups. Those who were in the ark and those who were left outside the ark by their own choice. Those who survived and those who didn't. Luke 17, 28. Likewise, it, as it was also in the days of Lot. Remember the, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Lot and his two daughters were saved. Those in the city and his wife were lost. There were two classes in the time of Noah, two classes in the time of Lot. One saved, one lost. When Jesus comes, there's going to be two classes. One saved, one lost. The Bible does not say that those who are left, are alive. It doesn't say that, does it? It says one will be taken, alive, and the other will be left. Those who were left in the time of Noah, did they survive? Those who were left in the time of Lot, did they survive? No. So what makes us think that those who are left when Jesus comes are going to survive? It's not biblical. Those who are left are destroyed. Does that make sense? There is no second opportunity. You see, friends, Satan has concocted this thing to mislead so many sincere people to think that there's a second chance. After Jesus comes the first time secretly, during the tribulation, now I can make things right, and then when He comes literally, then I can be ready. That is not biblical. We're going to be looking at some time prophecies on Sunday evening. Don't miss it. And we're going to look at the 70 week prophecy, prophecy as well. You cannot take one week, cut it off, and put it in the future. We cannot do that. The time to get serious about your salvation is now. There's no second chance. One day, I stopped on a farm. And there was a, a man, I won't mention his name, a good friend of our family over the years. And he'd stopped going to church and he was going through many battles. I could see he was really battling. And I stopped with the vehicle I was going to work with his goats. And he said to me, you know what I believe? I believe that when you die, you get to a T-junction. And there at the T-junction, God is sitting on a throne. This side is hell. This side is heaven. No matter what you've done, you just say sorry and you go to heaven. It's a very convenient theology that. It's not biblical. Now we must decide. Today is the day. Make your calling and election sure. There's no second chance. Christ's coming will be a joyous event. It's something to look forward to, friends. You know, if you are walking with the Lord, you don't have to be scared when He comes. It's when you have rejected Him. That's when you run and hide. John 14, verse 2 and 3. I go 
to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. You can hear the longing in the heart of Jesus to have us with Him forever and ever and ever. Just picture a little family that's busy praying and the next moment the rumblings and the things are happening outside. And they run out and they see, here comes Jesus. Just imagine, it's going to be so wonderful. So exciting. Here is a husband and a wife. They've laid their little one to rest. There's friends of ours who live up in Zanin. They buried the little boy of four years old a few months ago. I spoke to this friend of mine the other day. And you know that what keeps them going? The promise that Jesus is coming again. They will see the little boy again. When Jesus comes, friends, it's going to be such a wonderful moment. The dead are going to be raised. We're going to be changed. And that little child will be placed again in the arms of the parents. That's good news. That's something to live for. This hope changes the way we look at life. Jesus overcame death for us. Death doesn't have the final say, friends. Jesus does. Yes, friends, Jesus is coming on the clouds of heaven. And even here in South Africa, we will see Him come. What do you say? That's good news. No matter where you will be on this earth, you will see Jesus come. And if you are right with Him, your feet will leave this earth. Zero gravity. And we're going to meet Him in the sky. Is there anything that you would, would keep you from being ready for the coming of Christ? Is there maybe something in your life tonight that is causing a separation between you and your Savior? Friends, we need to make it right, right now. I know of a, of a case where an evangelist was presenting and he made an appeal to surrender your life to Christ. And a mom and daughter were sitting next to each other that night. And the mother stood up in response to the appeal. And she looked at her daughter and the daughter looked at her and said, Mom, you can make the decision. But there's still so much that I want to enjoy out there. One day when I'm, when I'm older, I'll make this decision. But you carry on. And the tears were running down the mother's cheeks. But she stood for her faith. She stood for her decision. She accepted Jesus and made her decision to be ready when Jesus comes. And that night they both went out, got in the car. And there was a tragic accident. Both were killed. And from our human perspective, we, we know that one was ready one wasn't tonight we have a choice we can make ready tonight there's only one thing that can satisfy today and forever and that is Jesus Christ and tonight I would like to make an appeal Eric is going to sing to us I just can't see Eric right now. Please come. And while James E. plays and Eric sings, are oh, you playing? Thank you. He's a gifted man. And as he brings a song to us, friends, I would like to give you the opportunity 
to make ready to meet the Lord. And I'd like to invite you to come forward. We have lots of space here. If you want to say tonight, thank you Jesus for dying for me. Thank you Jesus that you're coming to fetch me. I want to be ready. Lord, tonight once again we realize how much we need you. Lord, without you there's no future. There's no hope. But thank you for the promise that Jesus is coming again. Lord, we want to be ready. We want to be part of that throng that will leave this earth and travel through space with you. To the glorious home that you've prepared for us. Lord, I pray that we'll share this good news with our loved ones, our friends, those who we work with. And that our people will be prepared to meet the Lord. I pray that your spirit will abide with us now and keep us close to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.